Greetings and welcome to In Depth. We're very happy to be speaking with Reverend Nigel Clement. He's a minister in the diocese called the West Indian United Spiritual Baptist Sacred Order. He's also a tutor at the Roman Paris Spiritual Baptist Southern School of Theology. And we are getting into a focus on the spiritual Baptist faith. We do so now. So even before we go any further, thank you very much for your presence, <laughs> Reverend. And as opposed to Roman Paris, it is Herman, Herman Paris. Paris. Uh, you see, when you look at the transcript and the AI, the micro trip going <laughs> to trip and failure. Yeah? But I want to thank you, one, for making the time and looking at dates in terms of prohibition, 1917 repeal, 1951. Uh, what do you think are some of the biggest things at this point in time with regard to the faith? And let me also give the parameters that you may not be speaking for everyone, but we'll get into that as well in terms of the autonomy, I guess. Is it a different way of churches, dioceses, organizations within the faith? All right. Well, first, of course, I want to say thank you ever so much for having me here. Um, and just to, to, to give some context, so Western Indian United is just one of the archdioceses that exist in Trinidad and Tobago. You have a number of others, and they have actually all come together under the National Congress of Incorporated um, Baptist uh, Organizations. And so a lot of what I'm saying, yes, is some of which will be my opinion. Uh, most of which will probably be my opinion. I have to be guarded where that is concerned. Um, and as one of the vice principals of the School of Theology, I also need to be, <laughs> to be mindful of my utterances. Um, I don't know. I don't know that I can say what is the biggest thing in the faith now, um, because there varied focuses that you, you're going to find. There are some who focus on further education, some who are focusing on on the preeminence or prominence of the faith, some are focusing on self-image and, and things like that. So you have a you have a, a variety of issues that, dependent on the, the diocese and dependent on the leadership, you may find that the focus differs. All right, and so before we go into the faith itself, mm -hmm. speak a little bit about the School of Theology, thanks. Wow, School of Theology. It was started based on a vision received by Dr. Herman Paris. Um, he then went on after, he was actually living in Canada at the time. And then he returned to Trinidad. As far as he was concerned, he was going to spend time in Canada with his children, returned to children, returned to Trinidad, started this school. Um, and he died, he was in his 90s when he died. I think it was in about 2004, if I remember correctly. And um, the school, of course, has been since been under the leadership of Dr. Hazelan Gibbs, the Pisa. Um, the school isn't limited to persons from West Indian United because it is to some degree an organ of the diocese, but you have members of the faith coming from, from the other dioceses. Um, one of the, the, the other things is the fact that so let me step back a little. There are a number of persons who are of the opinion that you know we ought to have accredited courses, etc. The, the origin that wasn't the original focus. The original focus was to ensure that the membership of the faith, because you have to be a spiritual Baptist to be able to even um, access the, the, the classes. But the it was felt that the members of the faith needed to be exposed to things like scripture, for example, to the Bible, to the history of the faith, to an understanding of the traditions of the faith. Why do we do what we do? Um, so it was more about providing a forum for exposure and for deeper study into the things of the faith. So for that cause, there wasn't, okay, well, you need to have these prerequisites to no anybody in the faith generally could have come to the school once they were recommended by the leadership of their respective churches. I think sometimes too we we so inoculate in, in, indoctrinated into this 
certification. Uh, yes, you need yeah. to have a piece of paper yeah. saying that this is what you yeah. learned, as yeah. opposed to almost a, a level of being as well, yeah. as opposed to just saying, okay, well, this paper says that I know this. Uh, but that brings me to asking about the, the need for scholarship within the faith. Um, Cause it seems sometimes as though there are individuals who would come to something mm -hmm. from outside and they sit at the feet of elders and then they go away and they write something and they become the experts on this. So you take a, so, so I, let you, I let you take your, your breath? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just that <laughs> the, the thing with the faith is that there are, there are so many personalities, a number of personalities and there are a number of strong personalities, again, from diocese to diocese. Now, one of the things we have to consider is that for the greatest part, the spiritual Baptist faith started amongst the working class of the country. So it was, for the greatest part, anomalous for you to find someone who um, had a particular level of academic training, as the case may be, or, or, or was a, a professional in a particular arena. Um, you find more of that now. Certainly you find more of that. Um, and the, but yes, to answer the direct question, you have a number of persons, I for one, have been doing some focusing on the faith. As I said, I am really deeply interested in why we do what we do. I'm actually responsible for the, the course on tradition in, in, in the school. That, that I, I have a deep passion for that and for understanding that. Um, Dr. Hazeland gives the piece of the principal. She herself would have done some study on the faith. She's the author of a number of books on the faith. Um, and, and, and there are other persons within the faith who have started placing focus on the faith and taking an academic approach to it. So at, at, there's certainly more of that taking place now. There's no question about it. Okay, and let me nuance, let me ask the question again, but give it a slightly different nuance. Because sometimes if I say scholarship, mm -hmm. uh, you, and you answered it with addressing almost like academic rigor, I think. But just in terms of documentation, uh, the fact that you talk about traditions, mm -hmm. so that is regardless of the level that you are at, you have this level of knowledge being passed as opposed to somebody from outside coming and writing. And sometimes there's little tweaks and 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 twitches that somebody, because they don't have that insider knowledge, may get a little wrong. And I've seen a lot of that actually from reading a number of peer-reviewed documents that were or papers that were done by persons who came and said this. Peer reviewed, is it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, was, <laughs> it was it was it was interesting. Because you would see things that they would speak about. And as you said, there's a, a significant amount of nuance that they, they wouldn't have. So let me give you a, 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 an excellent example, though, which is quite funny. In pursuing my quest into understanding the faith, one of the things that became apparent is, again, as I said, because the faith started on a lot of persons from the working class, there's a significant amount of what I call, there's a, a sense of, to me, there's some degree of a sense of inadequacy. And you find that a lot of persons in the faith tend to look for external validation, compare ourselves, whether it be the Pentecostals, or again, to the more established, to the more established religions out there. Um, I am one of those who, I am vehemently and almost violently opposed to that because I think that there's a richness within the faith if we look internally that we're going to be able to see that it will it will open up to us. So, but I started trying to get an, an appreciation for the history of the faith and to see what was written and what was recorded. And I stumbled across a book written by an uh, anthropologist. He was, he's referred to as the father of anthropology, American by the name of Melville J. Herskovitz. He's written a book called, he wrote a book called Trinidad Village. Now how that came about, he had been going around the world, primarily to Africa and to Latin America and the Caribbean, looking at religions that were African-based or seriously African-influenced. So he went places like Dahomey and Benin in West Africa 
and then of course made the connections to to voodoo to candomblé to santeria to what we here call um some people call shango some people call orisha and he was on a ship that stopped in i say in transit in port of spain in 1929 and he said he heard someone on the ship speak about Shango and he said, oh, I need to come back here then because I didn't know that it existed here. Because of course Shango is one of the Orishas in the, in the pantheon of Orishas. And he came back in 1939 and decided though that he was not going to position himself in Port of Spain because Port of Spain was so cosmopolitan and he wanted to, to, to I hope I ain't going too long, right? No, 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 yeah. no, no. And actually what I will do now, and just as we talk about positionality and where it is he was going to station himself, we take a short break because mm -hmm. we're gonna we're gonna have a big half and a small half in this conversation. Okay. Right. <laughs> but stay with us to return. We are speaking with Reverend Nigel Clement. We come back after this with more. Welcome back. We stopped almost mid-sentence talking about what who some people call the father of anthropology. He made us. He he made he made attack back yeah. to to yeah, yeah, Tobago, yeah. and he he said he positioned himself outside of Port of Spain. Correct. He went to Toko, so he wrote a book called Toko Village, and he was looking at all of the aspects of village life in Trinidad. But in the book, there are two particular chapters, of course, which caught my attention. One was called the role of religion, or is called the role of religion, and he started speaking about the different religions that he came across. And he made significant mention about persons who he referred to, who are spiritual Baptists, but he referred to as shouters. And he started to talk about the role that we had in the community in terms of the way that we brought the community together, in terms of the way that people got a sense of 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 their own real understanding their own reality etc and then he did a specific chapter on on the shouters the chapter is called the shouters um one of the things he did was he drew a diagram of the church that he visited in 1939 i tend to use a diagram in some of the classes i teach and as a display and i well i know you have some history in the faith i know you have some encounter in the faith one of the things that we do is there where we'd use chalk or we'd use wax and we would draw something that you call seals. Those seals have spiritual significance. Um, a lot of things in the faith is about symbolism. There's a lot of symbolism. So it might be a cross with a star above it, you know, or, or, or something like that. And he drew the, the, this, di he drew this diagram of the church and he showed where at the door of the church and he labeled it marks on the ground, which for me was so funny. But literally there are marks on the ground. But there is so much more understanding. And that's what I'm talking about. So somebody external um, would, as you said, would write, but there's a lot that they would miss. Um, one of the things he did as well is he recorded singing um, of people singing hymns and singing choruses from that, from that period. Again, it is something that I use extensively. I actually had to right to the all of a sudden name is gone for me huge american you know where people yeah, would go to about, i think about smithsonian smithsonian that's it smithsonian and there's a section in the smithsonian that looks at indigenous religions and so forth so they provided me a lot of the recordings um which had me over the moon but but sorry i, I know i know i'm going on for quite no some man. time but why persons if they have a sense of their own history it gives them a point of reference. They can look back on it. They can say, this is where I came from, that kind of thing. It then gives them some level of confidence. Now, not to go back to the, the persecutory type of approach, but because of the prosecution and persecution of the faith back between 19, what, 17 to 51, and even after, because there were a lot of stigmas attached to the faith, there are a lot of persons who were disenchanted, who felt, um, well, if you want to put it this way, spat upon. And so they saw themselves and they saw the fate as not being adequate, not being able to measure up to everything else around them. And so I felt that when we're able to understand our history better, 
be able to develop some confidence in who we are, what we're doing, why we're doing it, and that kind of thing. So that's the direction I'm pursuing. So uh, again, all of this coming out of the scholarship question as well, which I needed to get back to because you said they wanted no, man, to get some money. I'm answers. fabulous to go down this, big, dive down this rabbit hole or goody hole or whatever you want to call it. Because, and what you're saying about the seals reminds me so much of Adinkra symbols. And people who don't know would just say, okay, well, is this cute going on this mm -hmm. or geometrical or whatever? But there is this visual symbol mm -hmm. that has a name that is accompanied by a phrase mm -hmm. that is this whole universe of knowledge within it. Correct. So if, if you're looking like something like a coconut, the, the leg of the hen, and it looks like this kind of hook or whatever, and then the saying with it is that the the hen treads upon the heads of the hen treads upon the heads of her chicks, but she does not kill them. And it speaks to this level of loving discipline that is needed, that goes into bringing up a person as a holistic individual, as opposed to just somebody who can fulfill a specific objective, which is what a lot of our education system wants us to do now. You can plug this hole, but you're not necessarily a person. Yeah. Yeah. So, one, the Dinkra symbols, uh, those are, those are, that's something that I came across, again, in exploring and understanding of the whole where we came from, why we do what we do. Because there were similarities. It's a friend of mine who, that's, that's something she did, that's something she studied, as well as linguistics. And there were things we were talking about and we realized, oh, this looks familiar. And she says, oh, that looks like a Dinkra symbols. Um, the thing is, you find symbolism everywhere. A simple thing. You walk out, you see a blue sign with a white arrow, the shape like that in the arrow is pointing that way. We all know what that means. Left turn. Even persons who are not driving and haven't done regulations, it's going to say something to them. And so in life, there's a lot of symbolism. Um, in older times, in a lot of those churches, whether it be Anglican, Catholic, or otherwise, when you walk in, even on the tiles on the ground or in the stained glass, you would see symbols, you'd see seals, you'd see a cross, you'd see a fish. It says something. It means something. So there's, I was going to say this, so there's no mystery into when we use seals. But yes, there is some, because we generally believe that a lot of these, when we use these seals, it's us communicating to some degree with the Holy Spirit of God to indicate our desire or to, to, to identify our office or our authority that we felt we were given by the Holy Spirit of God. There, there, are, there are a number of things to it, but of course we've gone down this rabbit hole now. Not a problem, <laughs> but we, we call this part one of the conversation, mm -hmm. but it's also interesting that when one group does it, it's looked at a certain way, when another yeah, group yeah, does yeah. it, it's looked at a certain way. But I guess we can get into that on the other, yeah, there's, on, there's, in, in there's the second lots conversation, lots because this is just the first one, and I'm yeah. glad that we're having, we're having two of them. But we've been speaking with Reverend Nigel Clement, and we, we're focusing on the spiritual Baptist faith, but naturally that would take us further afield. So this is the first of two conversations, very happy to say that. And on behalf of the entire TTT news team, this has been In Depth with me, DK Rostar. Thank you so much for joining us.